All right, this is InfoSec Decoded number 86, Matter. And we're starting with Alan, who has a zero-click iMessage exploit. Not a new one, but this is a new in-depth report from Google's Project Zero. It's about the uh, so-called forced entry exploit that uh, Citizen Lab uh, exposed back in September of this year. And uh, forced entry was an NSO group, zero click exploit of uh, iPhones, iPads, Macs, really any um, Apple product. And quite a sophisticated one at that. Uh, Google's Project Zero is calling it extremely sophisticated. It's very impressive. It's like more impressive than state, uh, state actor um, impressive, the technical sophistication. I can't claim to understand the whole thing. This Project Zero blog post is actually only the, it explains the first half of the exploit. I will attempt to summarize it as best I can. And uh, what's so great about this exploit, or scary about this exploit, of course, is that it's zero click. Uh, some other past exploits from NSO group um, and it's Pegasus spyware required that the victim open up a text message and then uh, infect them with malware. Mm -hmm. But in this case, uh, the recipient, the target merely had to receive the message and that was enough for it to execute. And it all starts with how iMessage handles GIFs. And apparently iMessage likes to automatically play GIFs and it will do so it will actually parse any incoming files that are attached automatically and it will ignore the extensions. So uh, if it thinks it's got a GIF its hand, it will simply parse that and then attempt to play it. And this is the core of the exploit is that um, what NSO group in this exploit has done is attach PDFs, well, sort of, that are instead being identified as GIFs. And the PDFs um, in, are very small, but have enough code which um, exploit a vulnerability in the image IO library in um, Apple that Apple's been using. And to make a long story short, it's a very old standard called JBIG2 that's 20 years old. And uh, it's just a bad implementation in um, the open source um, uh, PDF rendering engine, I think, XPDF, which then allows for a uh, integer overflow. It's just a very small segment of C code that's poorly written that allows for an integer overflow, which then allows the attackers, after a number of gyrations, to, um, and this is skipping ahead quite a bit, to make logic gates in memory and to make it Turing complete of all things. So within the buffer, it's possible to construct logic gates and then to create, in effect, circuits and uh, that is where this blog post ends. And I certainly was lost long before reaching the end of this blog post. If somebody else knows better, please explain it to me. But that's the, the long and the short of it is that this is extremely sophisticated and it involves multiple vulnerabilities um, chained together uh, with devastating effects. And I suppose that's a reflection of how much iOS or, or Apple's security has improved over the years is that it's now necessary to do this extremely complex, uh, construct this ex extremely complex exploit chain. On the other hand, it's still a vulnerability or was, but Apple has since patched it as of September. So, so long as your device has been updated since, since September, you're probably okay, at least against this particular exploit. And so for all that work, NSO just got blacklisted, right? They didn't yes. get much reward out of this. That's right. 
that's right, for targeting some uh, American diplomats in Somalia, among other yep. things. Yeah, if you're going to sell weapons, you need to have some controls. Yes. I mean, some, right. some very smart people figured this out. Uh, it might have been a team effort. Extremely smart people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Weapon control doesn't sound American. Very, very clever work. Ah. Think... Uh, all right. Well, I got the uh, the COVID news. So Omicron is the, the nightmare we were all waiting for. It doubles every three days in New York City. There were uh, people giving press briefings for just a day or two old saying it's not a problem. And other people saying, oh, no, as of today, it's a huge problem. So uh, the medical experts I've been listening to say that we expect rampant extreme spread in January and February. And uh, they say not only that, for even more fun, not only do you need three shots to protect you, and they're not quite sure how much protection that provides, but the monoclonal antibodies won't work against Omicron, they say. If you do catch it, and the new pills to stop it have not yet been approved. So uh, anyway, I think we're all going to be shutting things down and hiding in January and February from the looks of this, and maybe it will uh, calm down after that. Anyway, and Liz has got uh, an exploit where you rename an iPhone and a Tesla. All right, what's going on here? So this is actually a pretty interesting article, I thought, uh, and it's it's related to the um, uh, log four exploit that's been kind of rocking the the cybersecurity world for the past uh, uh, week or so. Um, and I thought this was really interesting. These researchers essentially. Um, switched their device names uh, and, and using a string of, of characters uh, that would send um, the servers on the other end to a, uh, a specific um, website. So they essentially managed to, uh, and they tried this out on a bunch of different uh, devices, uh, including iPhones and Teslas, and managed to uh, trick these servers for, that belong to Apple and Tesla into uh, visiting uh, URLs um, based on the way they had formatted the string for the uh, device name, which I thought was really interesting. You know, I would think that that would be pretty uh, tricky to accomplish otherwise, but apparently it's quite, quite effective. Yeah, this reminds me of uh, when they hacked into Google's security system by putting malware in an Android phone that would take over their security sandbox when it was executed. Yeah, yeah. So this was this is pretty cool. Uh, this is a pretty cool uh, exploit, I thought. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all right. And Caitlin has, oh, yeah, the solar probe. This is great. Yes, it is great. It is awesome. <laughs> so... Uh, the Guardian has an article written by, oh, it's just from the Associated Press. Excellent. We love the Associated Press here. Anyway, so NASA's probe, the Parker probe, it's studying the sun. And the way it's doing it is that it's actually sort of flying into the corona. Uh, so it's in an orbit, it's in a highly elliptical orbit, and it's going to make its first pass through the sun's corona to take readings within the sun's essentially atmosphere. So it's going to be literally touching the sun and somehow surviving. And it's going to do it again and again and again. Um, so every time it goes through the corona, it's going to slow down a little bit and its orbit's going to decay. And eventually, after a while, it's going to burn up and be no more. But uh, during its lifetime, it's going to make several passes into the sun's corona and send back data. So, and this is the first time it's going to be doing it. I can't wait to see the results. Now, the corona is like 10 million degrees, right? Something like that. How can it possibly survive that? Magic. <laughs> well, I was thinking there might be a little more explanation than that involved. <clears throat> um, yeah, no, I don't know. Uh I mean, it's the the corona ex apparently extends out pretty far. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, how anything can can survive that close to the sun? I have no idea. I mean, Mercury. I mean, not in the corona. I mean, it it technically survives. Um, I think everything is molten. It's it's, it's a molten radiated hell. 
It is. I mean, it's it's going to get very hot. Um, they obviously chose things with very high melting point points to for the components. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And I see Irvin is here with uh, Microsoft being evil again. Microsoft being evil? No. Yeah, the browser wars continue. Just blocked another one. that Firefox default so that. So Firefox made a way to easily choose that as your default, and Microsoft blocked it. It would seem uh, they're just determined to get sued again, I think. It's exactly. Yeah. All right. And so yeah, Irvin, Irvin is right now in an underground uh, underwater submarine uh, <laughs> yeah. passing, passing under the Atlantic. So he, he's coming, coming in and out. Yeah, I'm glad you were able to explain that. Yeah. All right. So, so Alan has got the uh, breaking news that things are not going to change. <laughs> well, there is a kind of change here. This is hardly a, a headline now. It might have been more interesting 15 years ago. But Google Cloud and Rackspace Technology have released a survey of uh, over 1,400 decision makers, IT decision makers from various companies uh, worldwide, I believe. And um, it's really the same old news, which is everything's moving to the cloud. And that's more or less the end of the story. But What's interesting is that this cloud movement is going to continue uh, to the extent that a lot of these decision makers intend to do away, completely do away with in-house corporate data the next five years or possibly a bit longer, but most. 60% of respondents say that they will have no data center whatsoever in five years. 56% plan to run serverless models. So that's an interesting development in itself there. Uh, there are the usual concerns about security and budget and all that too. But what it comes down to is it's very clear that even very large organizations have no interest in running their own data centers anymore. Um, and presumably among these 1400 respondents, uh, the Fortune 500 or Fortune 50 even are well represented so it's very clear that, uh, that this movement to the cloud is a real thing and it's going to continue for the foreseeable future. And it has some real consequences, I suppose, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not surprised. I'm, for, there's a bunch of grants at the college that will only pay for hardware. And I keep saying, who wants hardware? Hardware, ick, yuck, put everything yeah. in the cloud. <laughs> Unless we run our own cloud, there's really no point. Running your own cloud is really a drag. Somebody has to maintain it and patch it and all that jazz. But doesn't, doesn't City College have a whole bunch of IP space that they could lease out and make a ton of money on? Well, they have IP addresses. Um, last I heard, they might actually make some progress selling them. I don't think you can lease them out, but you can sell them. And I think they actually might have done some of that or to talked about it. But I think like most things, it just snarls up in the argument stage and never gets past that. But what they don't have is any good server room or any good, uh, you know, people to maintain it. And, you know, that's, I think, the same thing all these companies have. Then you have to have backup and power and a room and a technician all to keep that stuff up. When, why don't you just put it in somebody else's cloud? Anyway, um, all right. And then I've got uh, the mobile verification tool. I was interested in this. This is, so if you have been infected with one of these um, commercial exploits that governments buy, that they use to attack journalists and activists. Um, there's this thing called the mobile verification tool, which will import indicators of compromise and it will tell you if you've been infected by one of these known um, commercial devices that infect your phone. So it, they built their own tool to scan your phone. So this sounds pretty exciting. It would be fun to test this out, the mobile verification tool from Amnesty Tech and see how well it works. I think it would make a good project for my classes if it actually works. And Liz has got uh, a, the vaccine passport app. Boy, I've heard of, none of these things seem to have ever done any good. Well, this is a pretty interesting story. So uh, apparently they um, 
um, they had made the uh, vaccine passport app mandatory this week um, in the uh, the UK. They voted to, the, their government voted to make it mandatory after they had said, "Oh, we're not going to do that. We we won't make these mandatory for you to get into places or do anything." Um, so course they doubled back around and, and now did that so that's causing a huge outcry but predictably even before they made it mandatory people had found ways to game the system so uh you know they're trying to make an example of folks that they've caught doing it now, now of course the, the ones that they've caught are just the tip of the iceberg um you know a, a wise person once said when it comes to criminals only the stupid ones get caught um to some extent i think that's true uh in that uh you know yeah they're making an example of these guys but there are a lot more folks that are uh doing it that haven't been caught um and even in the article they said that uh uh they were uh that uh, one guy was arrested as part of a separate unconnected investigation, which sort of makes me wonder, did they just find out about this accidentally? Um, and uh, well, there was another sort of an interesting thing buried in this article from the register that I, I hadn't known about, but there it was, is, has apparently been an ongoing sort of a struggle because their uh, National Health Service has been, um, uh, caught in some deals with companies such as Palantir, and uh, apparently they were going to turn over a metric ton of data over to Palantir without any explanation as to what it was or why they were turning people's medical information over to this uh, company. So, um, you know, I can, I can kind of understand why uh, folks are up in arms over this. And, uh, you know, by, by making these sort of shady backroom deals with, with companies like that, the government's really not doing a whole lot to build trust in, in people. And it would seem like they're violating uh, GDPR or HIPAA or something. You'd think, you'd think so. Yeah, I see that they, uh, they just got an insider to add fake entries in the vaccine database. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, all you have to do is make a duplicate of the paper card. So what about people that don't have phones? They must have a paper card backup, I would assume. I would think so. I would think so. But, you know, goodness knows those can't be faked either. Well, maybe they actually scan them and check online to see if you're in the database. That would make some sense. Maybe. I think it's funny here in the Bay Area, you know, when I go to a restaurant in San Francisco, your phone and uh that's it and it could be nobody checks anything yeah uh, it's 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 theater for sure and nobody checked anything here in all this time except once it fills when i sat inside and they just looked at my phone with a picture of a vaccine card for one second and um defcon was very strict yes but I, i've been reading online as far as i can tell there's a uh there's one nightclub that actually checks your card and your id and that's the strict, but no, everyone else is just doing nothing. I went someplace in Oakland where they made you show an ID, but as quickly as the guy looked at it, I, there's no way he could have been comparing the names. And even if he were, it's pretty easy to manipulate. Yeah. I'm not sure how effective that is, you know? Uh, then again, I was really surprised that DEF CON didn't become a super spreader event. So it uh, seems who knows? I, I was pretty happy with the, the uh, things at DEF CON. It seemed quite effective. It wasn't perfect. There were a few people not wearing their mask right, but it wasn't a lot. It seemed okay. I mean, I, I, I can't help but wonder how much of the whole, you need to be vaxxed or the, the whole idea of the, this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated uh, narrative is fueled by just people wanting to get the economy going again, um, rather than it actually being a, um, you know, uh, the wisest course of action for, for, you know, saving human lives. Totally. That makes, the, that makes a whole lot of sense, especially because, you know, there's, there's been a lot of, um, you know, I thought it was interesting that the, uh, 
J and J booster kind of just got pushed through even before the FCC said, or uh, the uh, even before the FDA said, "Hey, you probably should go get this." They they really jumped the gun on it and said, "You know, go go get it now. Go get three and four. And it's like, are we sure that's going to be effective? Yeah. Well, well let's if watch. the FCC has something to say about the vaccines, that'd be crazy. Then right. all the uh, all the people who say we get five G off of those things would go nuts. I wish. Uh, my reception is still crappy. But, As we uh, all know, the vaccines contained 5G antennas. If only. I mean, my reception hasn't well, improved at all. I mean, I, I just I just went through a, a mountain and it, it's kind of working, kind of not. So maybe maybe I need a booster to, to boost my antenna. You guys want to get kicked off YouTube again, don't you? I can <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But I, here's the thing. So people just um we, we would never tell you this uh because it's totally wrong, but you know, take ivervectin to cure COVID. Oh my <laughs> god. Yeah, Caitlin, you always have to up the stakes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, for people at home, that was that was a joke. Don't do that. <laughs> but you know that regarding the uh the slowness of the government to approve things, I've heard studies that say, you know, the CDC and whatever the other agency is never intended to handle a crisis. They want to like make a research paper five years from now that can withstand peer review. They, they don't make quick emergency decisions. That's supposed to be some other government agency that for some reason is not working. You know, anyway, I remember this all with age. This is a problem with the American system in this way for at least 40 years where there's perfectly good drugs that people need, but we aren't allowed to get them for years because the bureaucrats are pushing paper around. But, but it is important that they do push the, the paper around to a certain extent. Um, there, there are a lot of companies out there that will sell poison, yeah, uh, that will sell drugs that look promising but end up having long-term effects that are not very good. Well, I thought that was the point of the emergency use authorization. That's what it's supposed to be. You're allowed to use it temporarily because of the emergency uh, for a limited period of time, and then we go through the proper approval. Anyway, um, so let's see, I think we're down to Caitlin with uh, no chips. No chips. So here's a very s small <laughs> one paragraph article by Nikkei Asia, which answers a very big question that's been on a lot of people's minds, including my own recently, which is when can we start buying computers again? And the Intel CEO, uh, according to uh, Kuala Lumpur, who wrote the article is saying somewhere in 2023 uh, is their, their current guess as to when uh, the supply chain will be fixed. Uh, there's just currently way too much demand and, and not enough capacity to produce chips at the moment. So you can't get your GPU, you can't get your computer. Uh, this has been going on for like almost a year now. Um, and it, it's surprisingly has very little to do with COVID, although I'm sure it does play a role. Uh, but hopefully we'll have the supply chains issue, the supply chain issues worked out sometime in 2023. So we now have a date. So get ready, save your money for that. Whenever's out in 2023, then NVIDIA 4070 series or whatever they have. 40, by then it'll be like 60. Yeah. All right. And Irvin has got the leakage by the F12 key. Um, yeah, apparently uh, is that the UK's version of Craigslist, Gumtree. They they put all the, the PII inside of instead of the, the page itself. So you just uh, open up developer mode and hey, look at that. Nice, uh, nice bunch of info easily available. Yeah, when you post something to sell it, it puts your PII in the source code. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's swell, okay. <laughs> All right, and then we got Alan with uh, Apple's office return. Yeah, you know, this is one of those side notes about the pandemic. And of course it doesn't affect people outside of a few tech companies oftentimes, after all, there are so many people who are still required to do their jobs as before, but Apple has delayed the return to their physical offices once again. And uh, they had been planning for a return on the 1st of February. Now it's been pushed back indefinitely, date to be determined. And uh, Apple's also going to be offering all of its employees a thousand dollar bonus so that they can buy better chairs and ergonomic keyboards and so on and so forth. 
And Apple's just one among many tech companies that have pushed back their return to office dates again. Google, Facebook, Uber have done the same thing. Um, and uh, some of them are now looking at mid 2022. Others have gone entirely remote permanently like Twitter. So it's you know, amongst, uh, amidst all this news about the great resignation and about uh, some companies having trouble finding new employees, there's this, this tug of war between tech companies and their employees who keep insisting that they can work just fine remotely um, continues. And it's going to be interesting to see how the Omicron variant and perhaps subsequent variants that cause more anxiety, justified anxiety about COVID uh, really do affect uh, long-term working arrangements, at least in tech companies and those types of jobs where people are able to work effectively remotely. I'm surprised our colleges haven't said, you know what, we're just gonna do spring online again. I think that may well happen. You know, New York University and Cornell had to cancel final exams, turn them remote because they had gigantic outbreaks on campus just in, in the last week. So uh, it, colleges are having big explosions. Yeah, and it's so surprising. Those kids and they're partying. It took uh, Omicron to do this um, and not the earlier variants. Yeah. Well, well, they had precautions. Omicron is much harder to protect against, apparently. True, true. And if you'd like, and Bloomberg has the point that by now everyone is so fed up with like social distancing and everything that people just aren't being as careful anymore, which I imagine is probably true too. Yeah. Although I think a lot of college campuses, uh, the kids at college campuses were operating as if um, the, the party had never stopped. And uh, there was a lot of irresponsible behavior, and yet there were only minor outbreaks for the most part, up until but now. They're, but they're young. They have nothing to fear. And they, oh. were, and they were vaccinated, I hope, which probably helped, but not much against Omicron. Anyway, I thought this one is amazing. I didn't know this. Windows 10 in 2018 added a cloud clipboard. So things you copy to the clipboard are shared with your other machines that you've logged in. And now you do have to turn it on though. Thank God it's not on by default. But of course that means the passwords you copy are in the clipboard on other machines that somebody might be able to get to. And so Firefox figured this out and arranged their software so it will no longer put passwords in the cloud clipboard, which seems like a good idea. This reminds me of another thing that came out, I think in Windows 8, where you would log into a Wi-Fi network and it would automatically share the Wi-Fi password with other machines that it thought you were friends with. So you'd end up getting in networks without the password because it automatically sent the password over. And, and Microsoft tried this before with Vista. In the days of XP, machines didn't have much RAM. And so in order to make Vista run faster, they said, we're just going to find other computers on your local area network that aren't using all your RAM, all their RAM, and we'll put some of the RAM for your program in the RAM of some other machine on your LAN just to make it faster. And I said, this is awesome. You're going to take other people's data and just put it right on my machine for me. And they never actually even deployed that one because that was too insane. But they've had a whole series of these uh, convenience features that have turned out to have security consequences. Wait, Apple doesn't do that already? Apple does it with iCloud. Yeah, and they tell you, shall I save this password in the iCloud keychain? Yes, this was Microsoft's attempt to do the same thing by just sharing the clipboard. I don't think Apple shares the clipboard, does it? I haven't noticed that. I don't know, it kind of sounds like something Apple would have done first. Well, at least I know Apple pops up a box and tells you you're saving this in the keychain. It will be accessible to other devices. I don't think Microsoft did that. Although I haven't tested it, so I'm not sure. Anyway, um, Liz has got deep fakes. Yeah, so this is kind of a, a disturbing story, but there's a, um, a website which uh, generates uh, deep fake nudes where you can submit closed pictures of someone and it will uh, digitally strip them and uh, generate nude photos of them. 
um, which is a little disturbing. Uh, and uh, essentially, um, they are starting the whole revenge porn as a service uh, uh, industry here. And they have, it's not just, just this one site, now they've, it's kind of crazy. They've, they've developed partnerships with other businesses and um, <laughs> stood up like a, 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 an open API that they've, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who on earth would want this service? Uh, that's what I would think that it would be pretty. Um, I mean, there are a lot of sleaze balls in this world. So for every sleaze ball product, there's a sleaze ball consumer. And is this illegal? It's not well, clear to me that it's a crime exactly. I was thinking about that because it's sort of like. It's sort of like Silk Road, right? Now, when Silk Road went up, that was easy to take down and process because there are all these harsh international drug laws. I don't know that there are harsh any harsh international drug laws co co um, covering deep fake and revenge porn. Well, if, it, if it's actually not really a photo of the victim, I don't know, man. This is pretty I think crazy. Well, I'm just thinking, I can't imagine exactly how the victim could claim damages and win. That's a good question. Yeah, I, that's what I, I'm wondering too. Yeah, I, it just seems to me like, uh, um, this may you be know, if there, I could see maybe if it were published, maybe if it were published, it could be covered under defamation or something, or slant, it might be, or some kind of slander. Um, but, uh, yeah. But I think free speech would cover a lot of it. That's yeah. This this seems like we might this might be around for a while. Yeah, I think it will. And 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 again, this comes back to uh, being something that can be very useful to manipulate political outcomes. Yep. All right. And uh, Caitlin's got the uh, Amazon. They made their staff keep working even when the building's falling down. Yeah, so this happened earlier this week, but I feel it really needs to be called out again. Uh, so the Insider has an article written by Isabel Asher Hamilton. Uh, so what happened in case people are unaware, uh, there were some pretty major storms and tornadoes and stuff going on over in Illinois. And Amazon has a fulfillment center over there. And in the middle of the storm, the employees were told just to keep working, even though they should have gone home. They're not unionized. You know, they can't go home. They have to do what their bosses say. And unfortunately, the tornado came and people that were in the building, uh, many of them lost their lives. So about six Amazon workers died uh, because Amazon didn't want to lose profits due to the, um, the storm going on outside. Um, and that's basically what, what happened. They, they really should have not been going into work. It was too dangerous, uh, but Amazon wanted to keep making money. They weren't unionized, so they didn't have a choice. They didn't have anyone looking out for them. Um, and as a result, yeah, six people are, are now no longer with us, so. Yeah, Amazon has a statement and they say fake news. Amazon, yes, Amazon, of course, says fake news. Um, however, they said, oh, no, 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 we, we, we didn't tell them to, to stay. I mean, they totally just lied. They said, uh, you know, we, we're not gonna tell them to stay, but we saw uh, somebody, one of the, um, one of the relatives of the people who died shared a uh, screenshot of their phone showing a text message saying, hey, I can't go home. I know it's rainy, uh, but they're making us work here. So, yeah. And I know there's a candle factory where a bunch of people died for the same thing. They tried to go home and they said, if you leave, you'll get fired. Yep. <clears throat> this is, yeah. Um, the candle, the candle factory also says it's fake news. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know. I don't think so. <laughs> God, there, there was, I mean, and this is, I, I don't know what, what goes on in these people's heads. There, there were, this is a minor incident compared to this one incident that happened in, I think it was in South America with there was this supermarket and the owners panicked about stealing and there was a fire inside. So they locked it and like hundreds of people lost their lives. I forget the name of the, the place. Um, but then afterwards, the owner was like non-repentant, blamed it on one of the people that died in the fire, and then said, oh, I know what we'll do. We'll build an even bigger supermarket, and we'll, we'll name it after the, 
the people who died, you know, and, and gives, give people some, some of the steak in the new supermarket. And people are just like, no, we, we don't want steak in the supermarket where our loved ones, you know, perish and we're still grieving. I mean, it's just the, the people, there, there is a term that I learned recently and it's called elite panic. Um, and this is what happens when people have, have been isolated from the rest of society, uh, the, the vast majority of societies who are not, uh, you know, in the capitalist class. Uh, and by the capitalist class, I mean people who own capital. Um, most people, even if you're wealthy or relatively wealthy, don't own like capital, the means of production. Uh, these people are so afraid of like uprisings or people panicking or just things going wrong that they just sort of panic in the middle of of disasters and they they cause a lot of people to die um and this is one more example so yep class war straight out of marx yep pretty much yeah but it, it is a, it is a noted thing that this this um this this elite panic um yeah, yeah. all right and Irvin has got a garage sale if you are in San Francisco today, uh, no Sarch Press is selling whatever they have in their garage from four to seven at fifty percent off. Which would be books, I imagine. Which would probably be books. I don't know what else they do, but apparently there's a sale today. Mm -hmm. Good, good. And I got one more here, which I put on the title, which is matter. I thought this was pretty interesting. Uh, smart homes are a mess. I remember a few years ago, I saw people tweeting as they went on a vacation and had like a babysitter and they said, oh yes, to turn the lights off in the bathroom, you need an iPhone app, but to close the garage doors, you need an Android app. And to turn off the fan, you need this third thing. And that's what people's smart homes are, just a baffling maze of incompatible hardware and software that doesn't work. And then when the internet goes out, it all stops working. And so a bunch of companies have banded together to try to fix this, making a new standard called Matter, which will um, employ Zigbee, Z-Wave, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth, and make both an internet-connected network and a peer-to-peer, point-to-point mesh network through your home, among all your devices, and transmit um, IP-based transmissions to control them all. So hopefully, they will all work, and they will all be able to be reached from any point, and they will continue to work even when the internet goes out. That's the plan. So this standard should be finalized by the middle of next year, and the devices compatible with it should start being sold by the end of next year. And maybe after that, um, smart homes will become smarter and less completely frustrating to use. I, I've noticed that. That was one of the big things when I was decorating my apartment. And I got a few smart things, not many, but I had to make sure they would all work in the same ecosystem. And I really think that's way too much to ask for the average consumer that wants like a smart light and a smart, um, you know, stove or a smart microwave or whatever. I mean, it's fine. Whatever, whatever is float your, floats your boat. You know, I just have some RGB lights that I need to control. Um, but other people really want smart everything. And you have to make sure that they're all can work on the same ecosystem. And it turns out like every company has their own stupid ecosystem. There is no standards. And it'd be great if we could you know, come together. I know there's the if this, then that, the ITTTT um, service um, that people can use, but I don't know. Yeah, standards are, are necessary for sure. Yep, yep. Hopefully the world could get a little less annoying. That would be nice. Another thing they do, of course, is they go broke and sell out and just pull the plug from the server end and your stuff stops working and all that jazz. Uh, yeah, and, and things can stop working even when they don't go broke. Uh, yesterday, I had to go pick up a package and uh, apparently the package server that handles everything got hit with Log4j. So, Neat. so yeah. you could not get your package? Could not get my package. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. Well, that's it for this one. Uh, it's Friday. We will be back Tuesday. We are planning to continue to produce these with complete total disregard for the holiday, unlike everybody else. So, you get your money's worth when you launch our free podcast.